I'd like to thank Indeed for continuing to support the Peter Schiff Show podcast. You know, hiring is one of those things that you don't want to mess up. With the stakes this high, there's only one choice, and that's Indeed. And right now, you can get started with a free $75 credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Peter. This offer is valid through March 31st. Terms and conditions do apply. Well, today the Dow Jones broke a seven-day streak of consecutive all-time record highs. The Dow did not make a new high today. In fact, the S&P was the only of the major indexes to put a new intraday high, although the S&P, like the Dow, did close down. The Dow was down about 100 points. It was a bit of a counter-rotation day on a reversal Tuesday, where we saw the strength coming back to some of the tech stocks. The NASDAQ managed to eke out a small gain. Money was coming out of value, particularly the small uh, cap value. The Russell 2000 was the biggest loser on the day, down about one and three quarters percent. This as interest rates continue to tick up, yields on the 30 year back up just below 2.4, a two spot 391. And the 10 year, Above 1.6, closed at one spot 6.21. You know, there's been a lot of hope out there. Some of it sparked, as I said, by David Tepper, that maybe we're going to pause here and rates are going to stop rising. But if you look at the chart, there's no real reason to believe that that's going to be the case. I mean, it seems to me that the path of least resistance for rates is up. And other than the Fed coming to the party with a big new bond purchase program, There's just not enough buying. The amount of bonds the Fed is buying right now pales in comparison to what the Treasury is trying to sell and what the rest of the world wants to unload. So I think this is just wistful thinking uh, that interest rates are going to stop rising. We also got quite a bit of economic data that came out today. Early this morning, we got the retail sales for February. And if you remember, the January numbers were really big. And that's because Americans had those stimulus checks burning holes in their pockets. And so they were able to buy a lot of stuff. So the expectation was for a small decline in retail sales in February. Instead, we got a big decline, but we actually declined from an even higher level. The original report for January was 5.3% gain in retail sales. That got revised up to 7.6. Ex-automobiles... The 5.9% original estimate was upwardly revised to 8.3. And if you take out gasoline, it went from up 6.1 to up 8.5. And the control group went all the way up to 8.9 from 6.1. So even more spending of government money went on in January than was previously estimated. So maybe not quite as much of it was saved. But the drops that we got in February, 3% on the headline number retail sales. X autos down 2.7. Take out gas, the drop was 3.3%. And the control group down 3.5%. Those are some big numbers. But I think Wall Street basically shrugged them off because of the upward revisions to the prior month. But really, it shows how much the spending slows down when you don't have government money to spend. Now, of course, there's a new round of checks that are going to be showing up in the mailbox or in people's accounts. So that's probably going to spike uh, the, um, the numbers. But the more important numbers that came out, look at industrial production for the same month of February. We had gains in the January numbers, and the consensus was for those gains to continue in February. The initial report for January was a 0.9% gain in industrial production. And they revised that to up 1.1, so a little bit stronger. But instead of getting up 0.5 for February, we got a collapse of minus 2.2. That's a big number. The only thing bigger was the decline in manufacturing output. That was up 1.2% in January, upwardly revised from 1.0. They were looking for a gain of 0.6. Instead, we had a drop of 3.1% 
in manufacturing output. That is a big decline in manufacturing. And look at what happened to capacity utilization. That went all the way down from 75.5, which was the downward revision from uh, 75.6 from January. That went all the way down to 73.8. The estimate was for utilization to go up to 75.7. So completely wrong. People were expecting the U.S. economy to be more productive. Instead, it was substantially less productive, even as Americans are still spending all this money. So how are we bridging this gap? If we're producing a lot less stuff, but we're all buying a lot more stuff, where are we getting the difference? Where's the stuff coming from? Well, I've talked about it. It's coming from imports, right? We're importing more products because the American economy, despite all the headlines, is very weak. That's why it can't produce. Anybody can spend if the government is handing out money, but it takes a real economy to produce stuff. So America is more reliant than ever before on the stronger economies outside the United States because those are the economies that are producing the goods that Americans are incapable of producing. So we're buying those goods and we're paying for them with the money the Fed prints. Take a look at what's happening to import prices. So the consensus for the month-over-month gain in import prices was 1%. And that was not quite as high as the 1.4% gain in the prior month. Well, we did have a little bit of of an improvement, but not much. Instead of going down to 1%, we went down to 1.3%. That is a pretty big gain in one month, especially when it follows a month of 1.4%. But where the numbers are even bigger for now, but they're going to get even bigger uh, when we get more of these big monthly numbers. Look at the year over year number. The year over year increase in import prices in January was 0.9%. But now if you look at the year over year from February, the jump is 3%. You know, they revised last month actually to up 1%. 0.9 was the original estimate, but they were looking for a gain of 1.9%. Uh, for February. Instead, 3%. That is a huge year-over-year gain. Remember, the Fed is talking about 2% inflation. Here we got import prices already up 3% year-over-year. And you know what? That number is going much higher. Export prices also jumping. Remember, these things were up 2.5% month-over-month in January. They were looking for that to go back down to an increase of 1%. Instead, they jumped by 1.6%. But look at the year-over-year increase in the price of the stuff that we're exporting. As of January, the year-over-year increase was 2.3%, which in and of itself is a decent number, right? It's north of 2%. They were looking for a slight uptick to 2.5%. Instead, the actual increase in the price of the stuff that we're exporting was 5.2% year-over-year, blowing away estimates more than twice the increase that people were expecting. Now, Federal Reserve keeps talking about 2% inflation. You're talking about the price of the goods that we're making here and exporting up 5.2%. These are some big numbers, but you know what? They're going to get even bigger. So not only are we making less stuff and having to import the difference, but all the stuff that we're importing is getting more and more expensive. In fact, another thing that's getting more expensive is building homes. One of the reasons that the housing market index, which also came out today, came out a little bit below expectations was because there was a big drop in home builder sentiment. It fell to a seven month low. And the reason home builders are getting a little bit nervous is number one, the increase in interest rates, because if interest rates are going up, well, then so are mortgage rates. And that means if somebody wants to buy a new home, it's going to be more expensive because the mortgage rate is going to be higher. So that is a negative for the home builders because they want to make it as easy as possible for their customers to buy the houses they're building. But those houses are going to be a lot more expensive to build because of surging lumber prices. And that was another uh, reason that home builders are becoming left optimistic. It's because of how much more it's costing to build these homes and therefore more potential customers are being priced out of the market because now it's going to be more expensive to buy the home because it's more expensive to build it 
and it's going to be more expensive to borrow the money to buy the more expensive home. And both of these things are going to go up. And it's not just lumber prices. Pretty much all the material costs and the labor costs, everything is getting more expensive about building homes. And in fact, we got more news today about rising inflation. Bloomberg was out with a survey of 220, I think, some odd portfolio managers uh, and basically asking these guys, what's your biggest concern? What are you worried about? And the most significant part of the survey, as far as Bloomberg was concerned, because this was incorporated into the title, that of the top five worries, COVID wasn't even on the list. So nobody is really worried at this point that there's a relapse in COVID or somehow the vaccines don't work or people don't take them. I mean, COVID is no longer even a concern. And maybe one of the reasons is because they think, well, if COVID comes back, we'll get even more stimulus. So why would you be worried about a return to COVID if it just means you get more stimulus? Because look at all these uh, portfolios. Look at all these stocks that soared. I mean, we're about a year. I think it was exactly a year ago today that we had that massive drop in March, a record point drop in the Dow, not percentage drop, but record point drop at the beginning of COVID. Here we are a year later and stocks, you know, we're hitting all time record highs. The S&P made a record high intraday today. So clearly COVID wasn't bad for the stock market. It wasn't even necessarily bad for the economy if you measure it by how much we're spending and just ignore all the debt. The only thing COVID was bad for is the debt. We took on trillions and trillions of additional dollars uh, to basically numb the pain of COVID. So since uh, it's clear that COVID is not a problem because we just solve it by printing money. And if you're a portfolio manager, I mean, that's exactly what you want. The more money that gets printed, the higher the price of stocks go. And so the more uh, money you make because you're charging fees. No, what these portfolio managers were worried about. The number one concern that these guys have is inflation being hotter than anticipated. So higher than expected inflation. That's what they're worried about. Now, their number two concern on the list, which is kind of relating to their number one concern, is that the Fed has to raise rates and that there's a taper tantrum or that they have to taper back their bond buying, which, of course, the only reason that they would do that is if inflation was higher than expected and they actually acted to restrain the higher than expected inflation. You see, that's what these guys don't understand. I mean, they're right to be worried that inflation is going to be higher than expected because it will be. But they're wrong to worry that the Fed is going to do something about it. What they should be worried about is that the Fed will do nothing about it. And that's what's worse, because that means the higher inflation that they're concerned about is actually going to be much higher than they think for the precise reason that what they're afraid of, the Fed doing something about it, won't happen because the Fed will do nothing about it. And so the real damage caused by inflation will be much worse. But the interesting fact about these portfolio managers being so concerned about inflation, and this is their number one worry, is that the Federal Reserve isn't concerned about it at all, right? The Federal Reserve, if you look at Powell's last talk, and he's going to be talking tomorrow because we get the, you know, the Fed's uh, rate decision. Of course, they're not going to raise rates. And so they'll announce that in a press release that they're going to keep rates where they are, you know, zero to 0.25 basis points. They're probably going to make no change in policy, but we are going to get the press conference and the Q&A. And so that's really, you know, where the magic happens. And I will probably be doing another podcast tomorrow to really dissect what Powell says, what he doesn't say and how the market reacts to that. But from the last time Powell spoke, he was assuring everybody that inflation expectations were well anchored at 2%. Yet all the anecdotal evidence that we are seeing suggests that that's not the case, that there is no anchor, that we're adrift in a sea of inflation. That's what's happening. In fact, look today at the five-year inflation break-even spreads, right? That's the difference between the five-year note and the five-year tip, the inflation protection, how much investors are paying for inflation protection. And this is the highest it's been in 13 years. You got to go back to 2008. And remember, in 2008, oil was like $150 a barrel, $140 a barrel. Commodities were zooming. The dollar index was at an all-time record low. It was down near 70. I mean, right now, the dollar index is just under 92. 
right? So we have a much stronger dollar now than we had in 2008. Oil prices, even though they've been creeping higher, they're nowhere near $140 a barrel. I mean, oil prices now are just under $65 a barrel. I mean, some individual commodities might be higher, but most of them are just getting back to the vicinity of where they were in mid-2008 before the financial crisis. Yet you have to go all the way back to that moment in time before everything collapsed to see inflation break evens as high now as they were back then. But I think that if it wasn't for the Federal Reserve manipulating this market, I think that expectations would actually exceed the levels that we had back then. Because I think the amount of money that has already been printed and the amount of additional money that's about to be printed and all of the debt that we have, I think that given all that, people would actually be expecting more inflation now than they did in 2008. And in fact, what people didn't get in 2008, though, was that the financial crisis was right around the corner. People weren't seeing that coming, so they just assumed that the trends were in motion at the time in commodities and the dollar. They assumed those trends would stay in motion. Of course, they were completely blindsided by what happened. But now what is distorting the market is the Fed itself because part of the Fed's asset purchase program includes buying these tips, these inflation-protected notes. Now, I don't think they should be buying these at all. I think to the extent that they're buying treasuries, they should buy regular treasuries. They should not be buying the ones to protect themselves from the very inflation that they're creating. But the problem with having the Fed buy the tips is that it influences the break-even rate because the Fed doesn't give a damn. The Fed isn't a real buyer, so they're just buying. They're not actually factoring in how high they think inflation is going to be. So I think having the Fed be a big buyer in the tips market is artificially suppressing those yields, which means the break-evens are lower than they would otherwise be if the Fed wasn't in the market. So if the Fed completely left the market, my guess is that the break-evens would be much higher. Right now, they're at 2 spot 633. Again, well north of that 2%. We're heading to 3%, and we're going to get there. We're going to pass that. That is why the market is so concerned. The market sees inflation going up, but again, they still expect the Fed to do something about it. That's why gold is not going up. I mean, gold was flat today. Uh, Silver was down about 30 cents, but gold at least is still above 1,700 at 1,730. But the reason that gold's not taken off is because it is expected that the Fed is going to be fighting inflation uh, by raising rates and tapering sooner than expected. Well, if the market's understood that yes, we're going to have inflation even more than they think, but the Fed is going to do nothing about it because it's put itself in a situation that I've explained on this podcast where it can't do anything about it. What just amazes me is that the markets haven't figured this out yet. The markets still believe that the Fed can do the impossible, despite how obvious it should be that they can't do it. And You've already got the evidence where the Fed was promising to do the impossible before when it came to shrinking its balance sheet and normalizing interest rates. The market expected that to happen for years as I was out there saying it couldn't happen because it was impossible. And now we know it was impossible because the Fed had to abort both attempts. We never made it back to a normal interest rate. We got to 2.5% and then we went right back to zero. The balance sheet never went back down to pre-financial crisis levels. It exploded to new highs and it's going to go much, much higher. So as a result of that, the inflation that is going to be necessary to finance uh, these massive expansion of government is going to be this huge tax on the American public. That's why I've been talking about my special report that anybody can download on the Europe Pacific Capital website at europac.com. You go to tax by inflation. That is the name of the special report, and it's on the front page of our website. Indeed.com is the hiring site that helps you find quality candidates with Indeed's instant match. Indeed searches through millions of resumes in their database to show you a great list of quality candidates instantly so that you can do the part that you really need that much faster. That's meeting and hiring 
great people. Unlike some hiring sites, Indeed gives you full control and payment flexibility, delivering a quality short list of candidates that much faster. With Indeed, there are no long-term contracts. You can pause your account at any time and you only pay for what you need. With Instant Match, you see a list of great candidates right away. And Indeed delivers four times more hires than all the other job sites combined, according to Talent Nest. So do you want that short list fast? You need Indeed right now. And right now you can get a free $75 credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Peter. This is Indeed's best offer available anywhere. You can get a free $75 credit at Indeed.com slash Peter. That's Indeed.com slash Peter. This offer is valid only through March 31st. Terms and conditions do apply. In fact, there were some stories this week that were focusing on the amount of money that has already been spent specifically for stimulus. So this isn't all the other government spending that it was going to do anyway. Just stimulus spending so far, and I guess this counts the $1.9 trillion that we've authorized uh, as of last week, but the specific stimulus spending is $6 trillion. Now, remember, I talked about this on the podcast. Over this year, the government is only collecting $3.5 trillion in taxes. So the amount of stimulus that we got for COVID in the last year exceeds almost double, not quite double, but almost double what the government collects in taxes in a given year, right? So this is massive stimulus. But when you break it down per person, it actually amounts to $12,300 per person. And that's about 330 million people. But again, this counts every single person. So little babies count, right? Uh, People on welfare count. Uh, People in prison count. And the reason I'm mentioning these people is because they're not paying taxes, right? So if you want to figure out how much the stimulus cost per taxpayer, right? What is the pro rata share for the people who are paying taxes, right? And ultimately are on the hook for the cost of the stimulus because it's got to be paid for somehow. It's almost $50,000 per taxpayer, Think about that, right? The government is telling everybody that they're going to get bailed out and everybody is excited that they're getting these stimulus checks, you know, $1,400 checks, $600 checks. Well, if you add up all the stimulus checks you got, the typical taxpayer, it's not even close to $50,000, right? There are some people that got $50,000. If you owned a small business and you got a forgivable PPP loan, right? You might have hit the lottery and you might have got more than $50,000. So, you know, you're ahead of the game. But if you're an individual and all you got was some government checks, even the people who got the uh, supplemental extended unemployment benefits, they didn't parlay 50 grand worth. So the average American who thinks he got a great deal from the government, right? Uncle Sam to the rescue. I'm going to bail you out. Here's two or three thousand dollars. Go shopping. How much did it cost you to get that two or three thousand dollars? Well, 50 grand, right? That's the deal. That's why government spending is such a rotten deal for the taxpayer. You know, it is a blood transfusion where you transfer the blood from your right arm to your left arm and you spill half of it on the floor. Or in this case, you're spilling like 90% on the floor. All this money was wasted, but the reason it was crammed through, right, what made it so appealing to the public was the bribery of, oh yeah, we're going to send you a check. And everybody can see the check, right? That's what's obvious. You get the check in the mail. Remember, Donald Trump wanted his name on those checks, the first one. So people would see, oh, the money came from Donald Trump, right? As if he reached into his own pocket. Problem was he didn't reach into anybody's pocket that they knew about. Everybody thought it was for free, that it was Santa Claus that was providing all this money. But all this money has to come from somewhere. It's going to come from all the people who got the stimulus checks. How is the government going to get it? They're not going to raise taxes. Although I did read there was one small uh, thing that was in the stimulus bill that basically says that any company like Uber or something like that, uh, you know, where you pay uh, a gig worker and the requirement prior to this bill was that if you paid somebody more than $20,000 in a given year, you had to file a 1099, meaning that if somebody worked part time and maybe picked up an extra 10 grand to supplement their income driving their Uber, 
the company didn't send the IRS a 1099. Now, because of that, there's a very good chance that the driver didn't report the income because the IRS had no idea that he got it. And so he probably figured, screw it. I'm just going to take my chances. I really need this extra money and I don't want to share it with the government. I need all of it because then they would have had to pay the self-employment tax, which is 15%, right, on top of their income tax. So I bet there are a lot of people in the gig economy who were getting this money and they just weren't reporting it on their taxes. So now the the new law says that you have to report any payment, I think, above $600 in a year. Right. So obviously they're doing this because they know a lot of these gig workers who are struggling haven't been paying their taxes. So even though they felt like they had to give these guys some money, now they want to make sure they pay it back by requiring the companies to file 1099s on basically anybody they pay money to. And now all those people are going to have to start paying taxes on uh, the income that they weren't paying taxes on before. So that could take away a lot of it. But, you know, as far as significant tax hikes, right, those are going to be reserved for the people who make, you know, $400,000 a year. But the tax increases, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but the tax increases that they're contemplating for the rich and for corporations, even if the government collects everything they think they're going to collect, which they're not going to do, right? When it comes to spending, whenever they increase spending or have a spending bill, They end up spending a lot more than they think because the moral hazards implicit in their spending program means that it's more expensive because people rearrange their their lives in order to qualify for the benefits. So more people get the benefits than they think, and so it always costs more. Well, it works the opposite when it comes to taxes. Whatever money the government thinks they're going to raise from a tax hike, they raise less. And that's because when they hike taxes, again, individuals and companies reorganize in a way as to try to minimize their taxes and also the higher taxes themselves can have a negative impact on the economy and so as a result of that if the economy is weaker because of the tax hikes they end up collecting less money and maybe some of the rich people who they thought were going to pay all these high taxes maybe they end up firing uh, some of the workers Uh, And now those workers pay no taxes. And now because they have no jobs, uh, they're getting unemployment benefits. So they're not going to get as much as they think. But even if they got every penny they think they're going to get, it won't even come close to covering the cost of the stimulus. And again, they're not even talking about trying to cover this stimulus. The tax hikes that they're talking about now are to try to partially cover the cost of this massive infrastructure spending plan that they're about to unveil. Right. And so they're just forgetting about this six trillion. Now they want to spend trillions more. Only now they want to pretend that the rich are going to pay for it. And of course, it's not just infrastructure. This new bill is going to be a hodgepodge, right, of all the uh, uh, Democrats wish list. There's going to be some Green New Deal stuff in here. All kind of stuff is going to be crammed into this next bill. And remember, the Democrats know that they have this window of opportunity. They have the Senate, they have the House, they had the White House. That's a situation Donald Trump had, and he squandered it. The only thing he did with his first two years uh, was cut taxes, but he didn't do anything to go after, you know, real cuts in government spending. Government spending increased on Trump's watch, even though he had the House and the Senate, and so maybe he could have done something. But what the Democrats want is bigger government. And they know that their best window of opportunity is now because they don't know if they're going to have the Senate uh, after the midterm elections. And they start campaigning, you know, next year. So they got to get all their stuff, all their goodies. They got to get it crammed through now while they can do it because they're clinging to, you know, a one uh, seat majority thanks to the vice president, it's 50-50 in the Senate. So one seat gets flipped and they lose control. So they're going to try to get as much stuff in as they can. So this is going to be a huge increase in spending. And so it's going to be paid for by printing money. So prices are going to go way up. So the average American, the way he or she is going to pay the cost of this $50,000 a taxpayer is going to be with a massive decline in the value of of their earnings and their savings because the cost of living is going to skyrocket. 
the price of everything. And I don't care, you know, what the government does to try to cover this up with these phony numbers. Price increases are going to be so large that it will be impossible. And remember, we got a lot of pent up inflation from the past that we still have to catch up to, let alone all this new inflation that you know, that we're unleashing. And it is going to continue. And the only reason that we haven't seen a bigger reaction so far in the gold market and in the foreign exchange market is, as I said, investors still don't understand that the Fed is not going to fight the inflation. In fact, it's going to be so bad that instead of fighting the inflation, the Fed is going to actively make it worse because the inflation is going to be so high, it's going to push interest rates up so much that in order to stop the increase, the Fed is going to panic and do bigger QE. The Fed is going to interfere in the bond market and print even more money, meaning to cause even more inflation and throw gasoline on a fire in order to kick that can down the road. If the market's understood that this is in fact what was going to happen, you would already see a bigger reaction. You're not seeing it because they don't understand it, but there's a limit to how long the market is going to remain oblivious to something that should be so obvious. And talking about the the higher taxes, I mean, they're already starting to launch the trial balloons. I mean, we know what's going to happen. They're definitely going to raise the corporate tax rate. Uh, They're talking about taking it uh, back up to 28% from 21. In fact, I'm watching or listening to all these guys talking about how, well, you know, businesses never really wanted taxes this low anyway. I mean, they kind of wanted 25. I mean, what are they talking about? I mean, we should have no corporate income tax. Get rid of it completely. I mean, I don't think we should have any income tax at all. I mean, no personal income tax, no corporate income tax. But if we're going to have one income tax, then let's just have the personal income tax and not the corporate income tax because all of the people who own the corporations pay the income taxes when they get a dividend or when they sell their appreciated stock. They pay the capital gains tax. So corporate income is being taxed. But the reason that you don't want to have an income tax on a corporation, let's say you you don't want people that don't have a lot of income to pay the income tax. Let's say you got, you know, your grandmother and she's getting checks on, you know, on her IBM stock and she doesn't earn much money. She's got social security and then she gets these little checks uh, from IBM and she doesn't even make enough money to qualify for the tax. But if you put the tax on the corporate level, then, you know, grandma ends up paying an income tax because the corporation IBM paid the tax for her, right? And then her dividend was reduced by the amount of corporate tax that IBM had to pay. So if IBM didn't have to pay the tax at all, IBM can pay the full dividend to grandma and then she wouldn't have to pay taxes on it because her income is low. Meanwhile, if you got a wealthy shareholder who owns stock in IBM and he gets his dividend, well, maybe he's in the top tax bracket. That's the person you're wanting to tax. And so he ends up paying the tax. But having the tax on corporations and then having the tax again on the shareholders when they get the money, that's a double taxation. And that's wrong. It's bad economics. It's bad business. We should have zero corporate taxes. Instead, we want to raise the taxes. And in fact, I saw Jack Lew, who was the former Secretary of the Treasury under Obama, and he was talking about how, you know, we need to have these higher corporate tax rates. And one of the things that he said in response to the point that one of the hosts made who was interviewing him said, well, you know, what if we raise taxes and companies decide to go offshore? They reincorporate or more businesses are going offshore because our tax rate is too high. It's not globally competitive. And so what Jack Lew said was that, yeah, this is a real problem. He said, this is not good for democracy. He said, this is a real threat to democracy. The fact that some countries have lower tax rates than others, and that's a threat to democracy that we have to do something about, which really strikes me because a threat to democracy, why is that a threat to democracy? Democracy is the threat. What he's saying is that the ability to move offshore is a way to protect yourself from that threat. So democracy is the threat to freedom. That is the problem because democracy is mobocracy. See, what uh, Jack Lew was saying is that we have a bunch of Americans who have the majority at the polls and they want to steal money from the minority of Americans who they can outvote, right? We want to impose taxes on this smaller group of people, and we want to make sure that they can't escape these taxes, right, by going offshore. So in other words, 
Freedom is a threat to democracy. What we need is slavery. We needed a way to enslave the minority so that no matter how high we tax them, they got no escape, right? And the way they want to do that is that they want to get other countries to raise their taxes too. And what Jack Lew said, and maybe this is what Biden is going to try to do with Janet Yellen, is try to get all the world's leaders to come on board so that we can all raise taxes together. That way, nobody can leave in search of uh, a, a more competitive tax regime, right? And what Jack Lew said is that he wants America to lead the world in higher taxes. And we're going to lead the world to the promised land of higher taxes. I mean, think about that. America to lead the world in higher taxes. You know, America became the richest country in the history of the world. America became the envy of the world by leading the world in lower taxes. We had no taxes. We had no income tax at one point in this country. We were the low tax haven. We were the low regulation haven. That's why we became so rich. That's why so many people wanted to come here. That's why other countries wanted to emulate us and follow our lead. Now we want to be the opposite. We want to be the high tax nation. We want to lead the world in high taxes. That's like saying we want to lead the world in, in low economic growth. We want, to, we want to be the leader in stupidity. We want to be so stupid that we have the highest taxes. Problem is the rest of the world ain't going to be that dumb. Not everybody is going to go along with this nonsense particularly a lot of these Asian economies, they don't want high taxes. You know, they want strong economies. They want higher living standards. You don't get that with higher taxes. It's like what America is trying to do. It's like we're the student and we're, we're the bad student in the class. We don't want to study. We don't want to do our homework. So we want to convince all the other students not to study for the exam. So we all get bad grades. And if the teacher's grading on a curve, right, and we all come in with really low marks, but then on a curve, you know, we can all get A's, A's and B's and C's because, you know, the bar will be so low when they set this curve. Well, you know, there's probably a lot of kids in the class, particularly the, these Asian kids, uh, they actually want to learn. They're not going to go along with the American plan of, of, of not studying and just cheating yourself so you can get a phony grade, right? They're going to resist any pressure that we put on them uh, to follow us down this primrose path to socialism. But this is what is going to happen. So they are going to raise the corporate tax. They're going to raise tax on higher income people, anyone making over 400000 And that's probably for couples. Uh, so for single folk, uh, maybe it'll be two hundred grand which depending on where you live, I mean, you're not that rich. You're living in New York City and that's all you're making, which is one of the reasons a lot of people will be moving out of or are moving out of those cities because of the high cost of living that are going to get higher, not only because of inflation, but because of tax hikes. But they're probably going to also jack up substantially the capital gains tax and the killer, the one killer, which I haven't read much about recently, but I know is coming because I remember reading about this during the campaign, and that is subjecting all of one's income to the Social Security payroll tax. Remember, they already made that change with Medicare. That 3% tax, you know, applies to all of your income. At one point, it was capped just like the Social Security payroll tax, but they needed money, and so they made that unlimited. The next thing is to make the rest of the payroll tax, I don't think it's 12.4%, make that count all the way to your, your last dollar. And they're probably going to tack that on to the capital gains tax rate as well. So this is going to be probably the biggest tax hike in U.S. history. The problem is it's not going to be nearly big enough to cover the biggest increase in spending in American history. And, you know, by the way, for people who forget how the Social Security thing started, it's all incremental. It started as a 1% tax. That's all it was when it started. And there were so many people that were exempt initially. In fact, there was no self-employment tax. That didn't get started until 1954. So for the first, what, 20 some odd years, because remember, Social Security started in 1935. So for the first 20 years or so, no self-employed people paid any taxes. And what was the rationale? Well, remember, it was supposed to be money that the government was going to set aside as an insurance plan so that when people retired, uh, they would have some money. Now, what the government thought 
back then was that, well, if you were smart enough to be self-employed, right, you were your own boss, you ran your own business, well, Cal, you're smart enough to set money aside for your retirement. Social Security was supposed to be for the guy who wasn't smart enough to do that, right? A typical or worker, wasn't a high-paid worker, wasn't really thinking, uh, wasn't prudent, and you know, this person may get to his old age and he wouldn't have been smart enough to save. So the government's going to save for him. And so that's why the tax came in. Of course, the whole thing was nonsense because the government spent every penny. So the government was more uh, reckless with the money than any citizen could have been. They took people's money on the guys that they might not have saved it. And then they spent every nickel of it. But of course, for the people that came in initially, it worked out just great because then they jacked up the taxes later on. You know, the first person... I'm a Fuller, I think was her name. She lived to be 100. You know, she collected like $20,000 in Social Security benefits. I mean, she probably only paid in a few hundred bucks in taxes. And so she made it out like a bandit, which is what everybody does when you get in at the ground floor of a Ponzi scheme. But the current generation is going to pick up the bag for all the gains that, that accrued to the people early on. But my point here is that what happened in 1954 is they needed more money to make the social security payments. So then they decided to include self-employed people. Hey, even if you work for yourself and you're clearly smart enough to provide for your own retirement, we want you paying into the social security fund anyway, because we need the money for the other people. So whenever they need the money, they find ways of expanding the tax to ensnare more people. And that's where we are now. I mean, the, the, the funds are bleeding money now. I mean, the government is spending more than it's collecting in taxes. So it needs another source of tax revenue. And what that's going to be is going to be making the Social Security tax apply to all of your income, not just to a certain limit. But again, that also shines a light on the fact that Social Security isn't really a retirement program. It is a welfare program because that will completely eliminate uh, any kind of relationship between how much you put in and how much you take out because all this extra income, right? Somebody who's making $10 million a year and he's paying social security taxes on 10 million, his benefits will be no higher than the person uh, who's maxed out at whatever it is, 150,000 a year. The benefits are not going to go up along with the tax contributions because that would actually defeat the whole purpose of trying to get more revenue, but it's going to uh, shine a bigger light on the true character of this program. Because a lot of people think, oh, Social Security, that's not like welfare. I paid into it. No, it is like welfare. I mean, it doesn't matter. All the money's coming from the same pot. You just think you're paying into it. You're not paying into anything. The Social Security tax is an income tax. In fact, if you look at the way it's worded in the Internal Revenue Code, it's an income tax. The payroll tax is an income tax. That's what it is. And in fact, by law, they wrote this into statute the government is not required to pay Social Security benefits to anybody. You're paying Social Security taxes doesn't entitle you to Social Security benefits any more than you know paying any other tax. They're, they've maintained the illusion by continuing to pay the benefits, but legally there is no requirement that anybody get Social Security. It's just that practically no politician wants to renege on that promise, even though it's not legally binding, because it means they're going to lose their seat. But at the end of the day the benefits aren't going to get paid because they're going to be inflated away. I mean, that's the way we're going to default on Social Security. In fact, I talked about this on my podcast. My father actually found a section in the congressional record where William Proxmire was specifically talking about Social Security and the fact that, you know, we were eventually going to run out of money or this was a discussion. And what Proxmire said is, hey, we won't run out of money. We got a printing press. And so we're going to pay these benefits. It doesn't matter if we have the money. We're going to print the money. And then this is what he said. And my father put this in his book. He just copied it. William Proxmire, who was the head of the Senate Committee on Money and Banking, right? he said, the U.S. government is going to pay the Social Security benefits. They may be worthless when the recipients receive them, but we're going to pay them anyway. So here you have a U.S. senator admitting that the government's going to pay people with worthless money. But of course, if the Social Security checks are worthless, then so are all government bonds. So is all U.S. currency. I mean, he was very cavalier about it, but he said, hey, politicians will never do the right thing. We would rather destroy the value of the currency than renege on a promise. And that's exactly what's going to happen. It's just probably going to happen maybe uh, uh, sooner 
uh, than, than Proxmire might have thought, or maybe even later, I don't know, because he said that in the 1970s. So I don't know what time frame he was imagining, but I think it's going to be happening pretty damn soon. Meanwhile, I want to finish up the podcast today by talking a little bit more about these non-fungible tokens. I mean, they're all the rage again. More and more people, more artists, more sports figures. Everybody is rushing to create these NFTs. I mean, why not? They cost next to nothing to produce. And you get all these people who are lining up to buy them under the delusion that they're buying some kind of rare collectible that is going to go up in value. In fact, I was listening today on CNBC, which is basically promoting any NFT uh, that they can find. And this one was a fashion company that was coming out with NFTs, which are images of sneakers. Now, you know, a lot of American uh, kids or, you know, young men, probably predominantly, you know, they buy these very expensive sneakers. And some of them, you know, the artists will draw on them or whatever, and they collect them. Now, a lot of people wear these sneakers. I mean, not everybody just buys it and just sets it aside. A lot of these sneakers are actually worn. People get a lot of status wearing these uh, fancy sneakers. But some people, you know, buy some and they set them aside because they want to hold on to them because they think maybe in the future, the ones that weren't actually worn, right, they might be more valuable. Right? Just like you know, the baseball card that wasn't played with, that was set aside years and years later, you know, the few that are in good shape uh, can be worth something. So maybe in 50 years, some of these rare sneakers that were never actually used and they're in pristine condition, maybe some collector uh, will, will want to buy them. But ultimately, they're an actual thing. I mean, anybody could put it on and walk around with it. It's a real sneaker. It's made of real stuff. But what they want to do now is do these NFTs where they're just a picture of a sneaker. And they're trying to say, well, it's just as good, right? In fact, it's easier, right? But, you know, it's easier to store. Yeah, it's easier to make. You don't even need any actual material to make a digital sneaker. You just draw one, take a picture of one, and you can make as many as you want. But the, the bottom line is, what are they worth? How much is a sneaker worth that you can't wear? Nothing, you know, but they want to send, well, you know, it's an image and you can collect them. Look, everybody who buys one of these NFTs of a, of a sneaker, none of them are going to wear out. None of them are going to be worn because it's impossible to wear them. So every single one that is produced is going to be around in the future. So why would they have any value? I mean, everybody's going to be selling these. And what's going to be the difference between one picture of one sneaker and a picture of another? This is a complete mania. And everybody is going out there. In fact, Elon Musk came out and he tweeted out, a video and he said hey I'm going to sell this video as an NFT and it's a stupid little video it's not even that creative and he announced on Twitter that he's going to be selling it and I'm not sure where he is selling the actual NFT if it's different from the tweet but I'm looking right now at the top bid on the tweet and it's over a million dollars I saw the bid yesterday it was at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and now it's like $1,121,000 to buy a tweet that includes a video, some stupid HODL video of Bitcoin. I mean, Elon Musk is laughing. Although if you look at all the other Elon Musk tweets that people are trying to buy, Elon Musk is not selling them. No, I just looked and the eggplant tweet which had a $20,000 bid. Somebody was looking to pay $20,000 for the Elon Musk eggplant tweet to me. The bid is gone. So now Elon never sold it. I mean, he could have sold that tweet for $20,000, but he never did. And now the person who offered to buy it has withdrawn the bid. And so now the, the tweet is worthless. But, you know, I have a feeling that a lot of the people who are bidding on these tweets, some of these buyers may not be real. They could be straw buyers. I mean, the guy who's trying to pay two and a half million dollars for that Jack Dorsey tweet, Jack hasn't sold that tweet. Maybe Jack's got to deal with a guy. Hey, you know, go ahead and bid two and a half million dollars. I won't hit the bid or I won't accept your offer. And we'll see if we can draw in a bigger sucker and then I will sell. I mean, because who knows what's going on behind the scenes as far as all these crazy points. But, you know, in looking at that, the person who had initially offered to buy my tweet where I said thinking about buying uh, Bitcoin instead of gold, think again, 
right, from 2013. That was the first tweet that I saw that anybody wanted to buy. The initial bid was $500, and um, I mentioned that, and the bidding ran up to 4000 right? And people kept coming in to bid for the tweet or make offers, and the highest offer was 4000 And I was intending on accepting that offer. That I mean, I didn't think anybody would top it, but I didn't have the account set up yet. I, maybe I just could have accepted it and had the ether somewhere. I don't know, but I was going to set up an account, and I just it wasn't a high priority to me. Uh, but I had a feeling that if I didn't accept it eventually, the bid would get withdrawn. And that's exactly what happened. I actually went there to try to, okay, let me see how I do this. And the day before, I was too slow and the guy withdrew his $4,000 bid. But the whole thing to me, I think is a perfect example of what can happen because basically I was holding my tweet, right? I didn't sell, I didn't accept that offer. And the price kept going higher and higher and higher. Somebody offered 500, then somebody offered 1,000. Then 1,500, 2,000, 2,500, 3,000, 4,000. So the, the, the numbers kept going higher. So on paper, my tweet was getting more and more valuable, but I was never selling it. I wasn't accepting these offers or hitting these bids, if you want to use a stock parlance, but I was just holding on. I was holding as the uh, tweet was getting higher and higher in value which is what a lot of these people are doing now with their Bitcoin. They see the price of Bitcoin continuously goes up, but they're not selling. But do all of those offers mean anything now? Because all the offers are gone. Now, somebody came back up and put up a $150 bid, and right now there's a $500 bid. So that's the top bid, and that bid could be withdrawn. Should I sell it now at $500? Well, I could think, well, why would I want to sell it for $500? I could have sold it for 4,000, so I'm certainly not gonna sell it for 500 if I miss the opportunity to sell it for 4,000, but the reality is the tweet's worthless. $500 for a worthless tweet is a lot of money. Yes, it's not as good as $4,000, but I didn't hit that bid, I didn't sell that, and I may never get the opportunity again. But this is the same dynamic that's going to exist in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is gonna crash at some point, and then people aren't gonna to wanna to sell because they're gonna remember how much money people were willing to pay for those Bitcoin at one point in the past, and they're not gonna to wanna to sell them again if they can only get a fraction of that. But what if the price keeps going down? What if people are not as dumb again in the future as they were in the past? What if somebody isn't going to be dumb enough to offer me $4,000 again for one of my worthless tweets? Maybe I should sell it for $500 before that guy comes to his senses and withdraws his bid. I mean, is somebody else going to offer Elon Musk $20,000 for the um, eggplant tweet? I don't know. That might have been a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Now, obviously, Elon Musk couldn't care less. But the broader lesson here is that paper profits mean nothing. The fact that I could have sold my tweet for $4,000 means nothing because I didn't. And if I want to sell it now, all I can get is 500. And if I pass on that opportunity, it could go back down to zero. And that's what's going to happen to Bitcoin as it comes crashing down because it's the same thing. You got a bunch of fools who are willing to buy it because they think the price is going to go up. When all those fools no longer think the price is going up, you know, there's no more greater fools. In fact, I'm laughing. There was this new... ETF that's about to be launched this week. And it's the symbol is FOMO because it's the fear of missing out fund. I kid you not. They're basically going to have an ETF full of all the overhyped, overvalued, high priced stocks that everybody is buying because they're afraid of missing out on the gains, right? Regardless of the fact that they're so overpriced, the mob is piling in. And so now you can have an ETF of stupidity, right? That's going to buy all these overpriced stocks in a one-stop shop where there's no real value add again, because when the bubble pops, they're all going to crash. So what's the point of diversifying in a bunch of stuff that's all going to crash? But I, I had a better idea. Instead of the FOMO fund, how about the greater fool fund, right? This is, you know, we're just buying all the stocks and all the fools are buying because I checked and the symbol fool, F-O-O-L, well, that's still open. So you could take that symbol and you can launch the greater fool fund and then people can, can, people can buy that. Oh, by the way, on Bitcoin, over the weekend, the price rose to a new all-time record high. We almost touched 62000 and then the market pulled back. We almost got as low as 53000 I don't think it quite hit that level. 
but we definitely traded below 54,000. I think the news that helped drive it lower, although Bitcoin doesn't necessarily need any news to go down, it could just go down on no news. Uh, but there was some news coming out of India on a proposed crypto ban to make it illegal to transact in, to own, to mine Bitcoin. Obviously, this would be very negative for Bitcoin. Uh, India is uh, the second largest country in the world by population. That's a lot of potential buyers who would no longer be in the market. In fact, they would have to sell. I think the rumors would be that if they pass this law, the government was going to not only ban you from buying it, but give you a certain amount of time to legally sell your Bitcoin. And if you didn't sell before the window shut, you couldn't do it without facing criminal penalties. So not only would buyers dry up in India, but the Indians who already own their Bitcoin might be rushing to sell, at least the ones who want to comply with this law. And I'm sure the law would have some very strict penalties for failure to comply. Otherwise, people wouldn't do it. But to be honest, I mean, I think Bitcoin should be a lot lower given what this could do and what it could mean if other nations follow suit. I think a lot of people are, are very cavalier in the crypto community about how difficult it would be or impossible for the government to ban crypto. In fact, they think the more they ban it, uh, the better it is for uh, the currency that you know, people will just want it even more. Just like, you know, when uh, drugs are illegal, that makes them more appealing because they're more hip and they're more cool. And so people may want Bitcoin even more if the government says they can't have it. Except the problem might be it's a lot easier to find your crypto, especially if you're using the Internet uh, to transact in it. Uh, so, yes, people can say, OK, we're going to go underground. We're not going to use the Internet. But if you take the Internet out of crypto, I mean, then, you know, the whole thing is going to come crashing down because that is supposedly what makes it so great is that you can send your Bitcoin instantly using the Internet to people all around the world. Well, if the government drives it underground and you can't even use the Internet, because the punishments are so harsh, well, then the whole thing has very little value. And I think if people actually were worried about it, Bitcoin would be a lot lower. In fact, as I'm talking, we've recovered. We're almost back up to 57,000. So not, you know, at the highs again, but, but well off though, 54,000 lows from earlier today. But all this stuff with these ETFs or cryptos, it's all the same stuff. People thinking that you're going to buy digital sneakers. I don't know what's left. You know, I kept talking about how when people wanted to say that uh, Bitcoin was like digital gold. And I said, well, it's nothing like digital gold. It's like a digital house is nothing like a real house because you can live in a real house. You can rent out a real house. You can't do anything with an image of a real house. It wouldn't surprise me if somebody starts selling digital houses and idiots start buying them. I mean, hey, they're better than real houses. There's no property tax. There's no maintenance. Just buy these houses and let them appreciate. Maybe they can have, you know, a good neighborhood. Maybe some celebrities will come out with a digital house and now you can buy the lot right next door and build your dream home right next to some celebrity, whether it's Kim Kardashian or, you know, maybe Elon Musk can say, hey, you know, I just built myself a digital house. Who wants to be my digital neighbor? And a bunch of people can come and buy these things and think, well, I'm going to trade it because I'm next door neighbors to Elon Musk. I mean, this is a really expensive digital plot of land, except it's nothing. You can't actually do anything with it unless you want to just pretend that you have something of value. But that's all this is. This is one big game of make-believe. And a lot of this money, a lot of this profits is just make-believe, right? It's like trading your $10,000 dog in for two $5,000 cats. You can pretend you have money all you want, but when the music stops, no one's going to have money. All they're going to have is the memories of the money that they thought they had, but they never took advantage of the opportunity to get it while they had it.